is about operational technology and industrial control systems cybersecurity. So these are the topics I'm going to cover. What is operational technology and industrial control systems? The differences between IT and OT. There's a few kind of important differences that people should be aware of. How do you design a secure architecture? And then just an example of a few OT, ICS, cyber attacks. So what is operational technology? So operational technology is hardware and software that monitors or controls physical devices, industrial equipment, processes, and events. Uh, Sometimes referred to as ICS, industrial control systems, or IACS, industrial automation and control systems. They're systems used to control processes in a wide range of industries, the electricity, water, and wastewater processing, oil and gas industry, transportation, airports, railways, Uh, traffic lights, uh, chemical and pharmaceutical, paper and pulp, uh, food and beverage, and manufacturing. And they are systems that act on the physical environment. They take data from the physical environment, from sensors, and they control the physical environment. Uh, There's a few acronyms I'll just go through. OT, Operational Technology, uh, ICS, Industrial Control System. So these are all computing systems used in an environmental in an operational environment, SCADA or SCADA, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. Uh, these are used to control dispersed assets, so stuff that's geographically spread out, like the electricity grid, gas pipelines, etc. In general, that's more uh, concerned with taking data, data acquisition than control. DCS, a Distributed Control System, this is a system on a single site so you'd have your control system on your in your plant or your oil refinery or your manufacturing site a bpcs basic process control system is another word for a dcs plc programmable logic controller so it's a controller that can be programmed and it would control discrete functions and devices such as valves or actuators and take data from sensors hmi human machine interface Uh, This is a GUI, a graphical interface that connects the operator to the ICS. SIS, safety instrument system. So in a lot of these plants, you'll have a safety system that's designed to bring it to a safe state and prevent an accident if things go wrong. So some pictures. So this is a diagram of a SCADA system. So on the left-hand side, you have your control center, which are HMI, your human machine interface, your engineering workstations. Your data historian, which uh, will take trend data from your control server, your SCADA, your master termination unit, and then you've got communications routers. And on the right-hand side, I have different field sites, one, two, three. So a SCADA would control systems that are out there in the field in different parts of the country. Sometimes you might have PLCs in there, programmable logical controllers. Sometimes you might have intelligent electronic devices or remote terminal units. And in between, you're going to have a a communications link between your control center and your field sites. This is just a representation of a basic uh, DCS uh, with your operator workstations, your network and your rack with your PLCs in it. Your PLC, your controllers are taking sensor data from uh, sensors and they are also controlling valves. These are meant to represent Uh, sensors and these are meant to represent valves. So the important thing to note here is you've got a primary and a secondary controller. So in an awful lot of DCS systems, you will have redundancy for resilience because you do not want your network to to go down. It costs a lot of money if your network goes down. So you're building resilience by having dual networks, dual controllers, etc. So this little picture here shows a safety instrumented system. So you've got your DCS here and your safety instrumented system. So the SIS works in parallel to your DCS. So it takes data from a sensor. In this case, it's a spectrometer that's measuring the flow of gas in the pipe. If pressure is too high or for whatever reason, it's beyond a safe set point, the safety instrumented system will step in and shut down. In this case, shut it down. In other cases, it might just release gases or bring it to a safe position. And then this is a picture, a screenshot of a uh, HMI, a human machine interface. The HMI will vary depending on the plant you're in and the process that's undergoing. Uh, This is quite an old one. It's a WinCC. And the interesting thing about 
uh, WinCC. It's, it's a Siemens GADA system. And this was the WinCC together with the Siemens uh, Step 7 controllers. They were the first known SCADA system to be targeted by a, a malware by Stuxnet in 2010. So the differences between IT and OT. So there are some important differences between, between the two types of networks. So with an IT network, confidentiality, integrity and availability, that, that would be the priority of things. You have a lot of personal data that you don't want to get lost. There's implications if you lose uh, confidential data. Generally, there would be a high throughput of data. But the availability is important, but it, you can uh, withstand a certain level of delay. Your software updates and your security patches will be timely, quite often automated. There's a shorter lifetime, three to five years. So in general, people are constantly updating their laptops or their tablets. There's a quick evolution of technology. Components are located in physically accessible facilities. So it could be a data center, an office, or people's homes, as, as it is at the moment. And it's easy to reboot a PC. Whereas with the OT environment, in the industrial environment, you're dealing with a factory where there could be dangerous gases, etc., the priorities are reversed. Your system has to be able to see what's happening in your plant. It's really important that the system is up and running. It's not easy to start and stop a PLC if it's out in the plant. It's not easy to, to start and stop the whole control system if there's a process in place. That generally, the process runs through. So you have to have planned outages. If there's a power plant running, you have scheduled planned outages. You are reliant on the vendor, on OEMs for service support, because the system that's put in will be a specialized system, whereas in the IT world, there's lots of multiple vendors for computers, your basic, work, your basic computer. Whereas for a control system, it will be a specialized vendor that you're dependent on. They may not allow third-party security solutions onto your, their network. There will be exhaustive pre-deployment testing. So whenever there is, uh, if you do want to add something to it, they will probably insist that it be tested beforehand, which brings the cost up. The field devices may be in remote, inaccessible, inhospitable locations. So, you know, they could be a wind farm the side of a mountain or a plant with hazardous materials or offshore oil rigs, whatever the case may be. There is a longer lifetime generally, so 5 to 15 or even longer in some cases. In a lot of cases, the attitude taken is, uh, well, the system's working fine. It's doing what I want to do it. Why should I change it? There's legacy with that. There's legacy systems and legacy devices. So there may be a lack of computing resources, lack of memory. Uh, they may not support encryption or error logging or password protection. In the PLC world, there's proprietary communications and protocols. And lastly, probably the most important, this, the link between safety and security and the physical environment must be understood. So any measure that impairs safety will not be accepted. So then this table here just shows a comparison between IT and OT for different security practices. AV in the IT world is routine. It's easily deployed and updated, whereas in the OT world, there may be folders containing config files that the AV will try to quarantine. So you have to exclude those from AV, your AV scanning. Patch management is enterprise-wide, remote, and automated. Whereas with the OT world, you have to make sure it doesn't break your IT ICS system. It has to be tested and has to be approved. So that delays things, and it also adds to the cost. Uh, the technology lifetime, three to five years, in the IT world, there'll be multiple vendors, ubiquitous upgrades, people are constantly changing things. Whereas in the OT world, it's a longer lifetime, and quite often it's, it's uh, the same vendor over time. Uh, there's really just a small handful of vendors worldwide that specialize in this uh, product. And you've got the, the problem then of end of life security concerns. Your operator workstation, it may be a standard workstation, but it may be end of life and the ICS manufacturer will have to have a roadmap for moving on to the next version. Change management is regular and scheduled, whereas in the OT world, it may impact on production. So you may have to kind of, it's much more controlled. Physical and sec environmental security. In the IT world, it's variable. Uh, some places are very good. Data centers tend to be very good. Some places less so. 
in the OT world, physical and environmental security is usually excellent, particularly for the control centers. Maybe less so for remote sites. And the important thing to remember here is if an attacker can physically access your network and get onto your network, you have to protect it. It's a risk. Secure systems development. It should be an integral part of development process for IT systems. Whereas for the OT world, it, they're just catching up. Historically, it was not an integral part of the development process. And then lastly, when things go wrong, in the IT world, it can lead to delays, disruptions, financial loss, system may need to be rebuilt. Whereas in the OT world, physical processes will cease. Uh, you know, there may be no electricity, no water, the trains might stop running. Physical damage to equipment can occur if something explodes. It can cause massive damage. And there's always the possible potential for injuries and death. If you look at the standard IT security best practices, being patching, AV, vulnerability scanning, endpoint agents, encryption, you have to consider your OT environment before you do any of these things. So for patching, your plant may have to stop. You may need to wait for an operational outage before you can do your patching. Uh, AV might be incomplete. Uh, certain folders may be excluded. Vulnerability scanning, it may just crash uh, controllers, so you may not be able to do it when the plant is running. Um, endpoint ages, you may have devices which are just not capable of supporting them. And then latency for encryption, that may bring in delays. So if there's delays in a plant and people can't see what's happening, that will impair safety. Uh, secure architecture for OT and ICS. The recognized standard is the Purdue model. It's a reference architecture for industrial control systems and a model for network segmentation. It's been around for quite a while. So most people that deal with manufacturing and industrial control systems will be familiar with this. Basically, it's a model for segmenting your network, separating out your, your enterprise, your corporate network from your manufacturing ICS network. You have to assume that your enterprise network is insecure because there's people on there searching the internet, opening up emails, clicking on links, and you do not want a virus to get into your control network. Uh, there's different levels in the model. So level zero at the bottom is your basic uh, process the actual sensors and actuators and valves and motors, the basic devices that act on your process. Level one then is the basic control. These are the controllers that take the data or send commands down to these devices. Uh, level two would be the local area control or GCS that controls multiple controllers. Uh, you will also have a separate zone and separate network for your safety system. Keep it segregated, it's segmented. Then level three is your operating, your site operations, monitoring and control systems. So your Pi historian would be in there, your SCADA servers, your engineering and operating workstations, production scheduling systems. And then you'll have a DMZ where your a patch and AV server, your servers are your shared historian, your shared application service, remote access service comes in through your DMZ. And then on top, you've got your enterprise system with all the business systems that you need to keep your business running. The important thing about this model is there should be no direct access from the corporate network to the plant manufacturing network. Uh, data should be pushed upwards. Uh, so any historian data that you need for data analytics should always be pushed upwards. You should never dip down into it. You should always go up. You need to control remote access. You know, you're, if you have vendors who need remote access to support your systems, you need to control them. You need to log what they're doing and you know, have uh, strict access controls about it. I was going to go through a few examples of cyber attacks. I've kind of split it up into two different types. There's the kind of traditional ones and there's the ICS specific. So traditional ones are really, you know, it's a virus, it's a ransomware. It's a piece of malware, and they will get into a network the same way as they get into most networks. Somebody plugs in a USB that's infected, or they click on a link, or they open a document, or etc. When attacks happen, it can have devastating consequences for companies. So the first one there is 2012, Shamoon. There was a virus that infected uh, 
35,000 Saudi Aramco workstations. So you can just imagine the chaos that that happened, caused that organization. Uh, North Petya in 2017, this was a piece of malware. The attack first started in Ukraine, but spread worldwide. And there was a number of different organizations that were really heavily impacted by it. Maersk Shipping, I think in about 50,000 of their endpoints were in- infected. They had to rebuild their entire IT infrastructure. Merck was infected. The pharmaceutical company was infected by it. TNT and a load more were uh, affected by it. Norsk Hydro last year, uh, that was the Locker Goga ransomware. Again, they had to, they lost a lot of money. Then just in February, there was a ransomware attack on a natural gas uh, pipeline operator. Um, they had to shut down for a couple of days um, to sort it out. But they would all have been attacks on Windows workstations, really. Whereas the bottom ones here are ICS specific ones. So these are ones that specifically went after uh, industrial control systems. So the Stuxnet, the first industrial control system cyber attack. Ukraine in December 2015, the power grid was attacked. Again in Ukraine a year later, crash override destroyer, uh, power energy sector was attacked. And then 2017, I put that in there because that was the safety system was attacked. So I'll just go through a few of these. So Stuxnet, so this is an attack that happened in 2010 on the centrifuges of a uranium enrichment facility in Natanz in Iran. And these are the centrifuges here, these uh, silver things here. So it was introduced into the ICS network via an infected USB drive. And this was a completely air-gapped facility. They were really careful about security, but the uh, attackers got in via vendors, uh, support vendors that were coming in to do some support work on the network. They infected their network and uh, they brought in an infected USB drive into the network. So this was a worm that went around searching for Siemens Step 7 software. So Siemens Step 7 were the controllers that controlled these centrifuges. When they found one, they started to spin up the centrifuges faster and slower. Meanwhile, the operator station, everything appeared normal. So it Effectively, they destroyed a whole load of these centrifuges. The engineers on site probably would have known that something was wrong, were suspicious, but they just couldn't figure it out. It took them a long while to figure out what it was. One of the engineers connected his work laptop to his home network, so Stuxnet was unleashed into the wild. Ukraine in 2015. So this was an attack on three power companies just before Christmas in 2015. So they gained access to the corporate networks and then they pivoted onto the SCADA network. So they disconnected substations from the grid. So nearly a quarter million people were without power in December in Ukraine. So I'd say it was pretty miserable. To overcome it, they manually had to go out to the substations and manually reconnect them to the grid. The Ukrainian grid operators were without, were without their SCAD environment um, and they lost the ability of automated control for upwards of a year in some locations. Now, I, I won't uh, click on this YouTube link. Um, you can do that yourself at another date, but it's actually it's only about a minute long. And it, it's a film of uh, some of the engineers in the operator operations room took at the time. And you can see this kind of mystery mouse going around to the SCADA system and basically disconnecting everything from the, from the SCADA system. And what's also interesting about that is the, the comment they make between themselves. One of them says at one point, he says, maybe we should contact IT. And then somebody else says, oh, maybe this is IT doing this, which kind of would make you worry about their, the cooperation they have within that organization between their IT and their OT engineers because you're both actually doing the same thing. You're trying to protect your network. This was another attack in Ukraine a year later. Crash override in destroyer. So it it infected the the HMI machines, the operator workstations. An electricity station outside Kiev was was targeted and the breakers were opened. They were disconnected from the grid. They also attempted a DDoS attack on protective relays. These were these Siemens Sipsiprotect protective relays. When you open or close a breaker, when you close a breaker, quite often you get a spike. And these Sipratech relays are designed to stop that spike damaging the network. So the attackers knew that the previous year, when the breakers were opened, they sent engineers out 
to close the breakers, physically close them. So they were expecting that to happen again this time. But this time, if they had been successful and those relays were out of action, when they reconnected the breakers, they would have physically damaged the network. So that's probably made it kind of more sinister. There was a lot of thought that went into that attack. And then Crisis Hatman. Uh, this is an attack on the safety system in a Saudi Arabian petrochemical plant. So the Schneider Electric have these Triconics safety SIS controllers. The attackers got onto the network via the IT network, to the OT network, to the SIS network. They obviously put a lot of thought into this because these Triconics SIS controllers have their own proprietary controllers. So they must have had them to kind of get the test to, to, to hone in their malware. But they made a mistake and it didn't work and it, the SIS actually tripped. The first time it, it tripped, they investigated, the petrochemical plant investigated and couldn't see anything wrong. They thought it was a maintenance issue and they restarted the plant. This time the attackers patched their malware, uh, but they were unsuccessful and the SIS tripped again a second time. This time it was more thoroughly investigated and they brought in specialist investigators to figure out what was going wrong. I think the first time they just assumed it was, oh, it was a network issue, but the second time they put a lot more thought into it and to investigate it. Schneider have released tools to detect it and remove it from memory. Ransomware, on this is the last one I'm going to just go through. This is a ransomware attack on a natural gas pipeline. The US CERT issued an alert about it uh, on the 18th of February. It was a natural gas compression facility. So it was got into the network via a spear phishing email onto the IT network and then onto the OT network. And ransomware was on both networks. So the victim lost view of uh, the human operators, couldn't see what was happening. The plant was still working fine. It wasn't necessarily a safety issue, but they couldn't, the operators couldn't see what was happening. So they had to shut down the network because if you can't see what's happening for safety reasons, you have to shut down. So they had to replace equipment and uh, use uh, last known good configuration backups. And it's also linked to another attack that happened on the US Coast Guard last December as well. That's more or less the end of the talk. I have, I've just listed a few resources here. The NCSC, we, we issue uh, news and alerts. Uh, we also have 12 steps to cyber security for Irish businesses. And the steps and, uh, in there are applicable to all businesses, really. Um, and then... Upcoming events, uh, Jackie Fox is giving a talk on the ransomware landscape next Wednesday. And then Fresh Faces in Cyber, Dina Vipuri and Fiona Murphy on the 24th of June. I think we have some questions. Uh, hi, Isha. As OT systems typically are in areas such as manufacturing, energy, healthcare, transportation, all run by government agents or large corporations, would it be true to say that these are generally pretty secure? But you, uh, you, you would hope they are. Um, but uh, I suppose the issue with cybersecurity is you always have to be uh, vigilant. Uh, you know, we have to be kind of lucky all the time. The attacker only needs to be lucky once. Um, and, you know, all these systems, no matter where you are, uh, you're dealing with people and people do make mistakes. Do IT and OT teams work together to secure OT, IT and IoT systems? Or do they generally secure their own environments? Uh, we are seeing more convergence. Um, and uh, that's why actually I wanted this talk to take place because I, it is important for IT people to understand the kind of physical constraints that OT people are working under. Um, it's, it's um, you know, sometimes, you know, IT people can say, oh, they, they don't patch properly, whatever. But the reality is there's a reason why they don't do these things. So it's not, it's not that they're negligent in their job. It's just that there is a reason why they do it. Uh, so it's really important for IT people to understand the, the physical constraints that happen in the OT world. Should different credentials be used for IT and OT networks? That's a good one. Um, yes, because, um, you know, if an attacker is going to pivot from, uh, you know, from one network to another, and if they have the credentials for both networks, it's much easier for them, much, much easier. Um, so different credentials, different authentication as well, systems as well. Is there training for OT engineers to inform them of IT considerations? 
general IT cybersecurity training will cover that. Um, but also uh, this publication here, it's from NIST. NIST is the North American Standards and Technology Agency, special publication 882 R2, NIST Guide to ICS Security. And that's actually a very good document, um, explains everything. Um, so it's a, it's a good one to read. Are there any guides to securing networks? Um, yes, as well as that one, SANS have some good stuff as well. So just another one here, uh, ICS, a secure architecture for industrial control systems. Um, as well as that, if you, if you go on to any of the actual vendors, they quite often produce some good, good uh, documentation videos. Obviously, it's a marketing tool that they use, so they will be advertising their own products. Um, but they are, they are worth looking at. So thanks to everybody for coming along today. And, and I hope you're all well and take care and uh, look after everybody. Um, bye for now. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this webinar, please follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn to be kept up to date with all our news, events and programmes. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos like this one.